Um, in my Bible, the heading for this particular section, now again, this is Leviticus chapter 23, says, Feasts of the Lord. And I'll just read through the first uh, handful of verses here. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. And the, the, the word in, in Hebrew for feast is, is moed, and it means appointed time, okay? Or, or, or this is a sacred season, okay? So this, this is the word that God is using for his holly days, or holy days, what we now call holidays. And there's a holiday that we have coming up soon, right? I mean, it's Labor Day. I mean, we've been getting Labor Day flyers for weeks now, and... You know, after Labor Day, let's see, there's Columbus Day, and after Columbus Day, there's Thanksgiving, and after Thanksgiving, there's Christmas, and then it all starts all over again, right? Well, none of those are actually ordained by God. None of them. Christmas is not ordained by God. Did he just say that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, Jesus was not born on December 25th. Understand that, okay? Now, if I've shattered somebody, if I've shipwrecked you right now, please forgive me. I'm required to teach truth when I stand up here, okay? But God has ordained his feasts, his feasts, his holy days, his holidays. And the first one he talks about is in verse 3, and it's called the Sabbath. Six days, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So in other words, we as believers in God... He's telling us here, in the, again, this is the Old Testament, all right? This is the Old Testament. He's saying, you work six days and you rest on the seventh. Now, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. But there were times when I was a young man, full of vim and vigor, working a hundred hours a week at the job that I had. Anybody experiencing that now? <laughs> Okay, okay. 100 hours a week. Understand, you only have 168 every week. So if you're working 100, that leaves 68 to bathe, eat, sleep, recreate, drive on the highway to get to where you do your work, etc., etc. All right, so that's not a whole lot. Now, understand, I'm also a man that needs about four or five hours of sleep max. Of course, then again, you can ask my wife, and she will walk into my office sometimes and find me complete power nap, drooling on my desk, and but that's just a power nap. That's not sleep. <laughs> Six days you'll work, and the seventh is a solemn day of rest. Verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. That word convocation is a, is a Hebrew word, and I'm not, I'm not going to butcher it here. It's mikra, which means a calling together. So it's not just a sacred season, but it's a calling together. And in gathering, some people will use that word. All right? Verse 5, on the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. The first month is a month called Nisan, N-I-S-A-N, all right? And that, that, that word Passover, that, that brings to mind what happened back in, um, what was it, Exodus um, chapter 12, verses 1 through 30, and that's where... Basically, Moses had been pleading with, with Pharaoh all this time. In fact, if we turn there real quick, you don't have to turn there, I'll go there. I said it was Je Exodus 12. Probably help if I went to Exodus, not Genesis. <laughs>
It came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captives who is in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. There was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Now that's the end of that part of the story. The beginning of that part of the story has to do with the instructions that God gave Moses. And the instructions simply were, take a lamb, a one-year-old lamb, slaughter it, take the blood, and paint the two doorposts of the house and the lintel. Okay? So basically, paint that, paint that, paint that. And in so doing, the person that does that is identifying with God and agreeing that when the spirit of death that God sends through the land of Egypt at that point, when that spirit sees that on the doorpost, he will pass over that house. He will not touch the people inside that house. In other words, that's a protection for those people. All right. Now that's back in, back in Exodus. This is the feast commemorating that. Years later, they're saying, you will have this feast commemorating that. And they specify the, the actual day that it, uh, that it occurs on there. And that's uh, the 14th day of the first month of Nisan. This feast, Passover, and the, the feast of the unleavened bread, and the feast of the first fruits, these are called the spring feasts. Because as it turns out, they all happen within three days of each other. All right? Kind of interesting thing that we you know, don't really think about because we really don't study the calendar too much in, in the Old Testament. But going back to Leviticus. <coughs> Verse 6, and on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Who knows what unleavened bread is? Bread without yeast. Bread without yeast. Like under bread? Yep. Bread that doesn't rise. Good job. Yeast, or leaven, is an indication in Scripture of sin of sin. God is giving the instructions to the Israelite people here, do not eat bread with yeast in it for these seven days. And why does he say that? Well, it says, on the first day you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no customary work on it, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation, and you shall do no customary, customary work on that. It said that if one ate unleavened, or ate leavened bread during that time, he would be put out from the nation Israel. Heavy thought. In other words, your family turns you out. You're not welcome here anymore. Back in those days, that was a big deal. Back in our current time, that's probably helpful for mom and dad in, in certain situations. <laughs> Verse 9, the Feast of first fruits. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you, and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. The harvest they're talking about here is the barley harvest. All right? And no, they were not making hops and so forth. We're talking about a grain that they ate as food. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day, when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year without blemish is a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma. And its drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your Lord. To, you, to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all, all your dwellings. So in other words, they set this up again. And, yeah, and the ephah, by the way, is about, about one and a quarter cubic feet. It's about a bushel. Okay, so you got about a bushel of flour. A hen is about a gallon and a half. So one-fourth of that is about a quart, a quart and a half or so. These, 
These first three, as I said before, the spring feasts. They happen the 14th, the 15th, and the 17th of the month of Nisan. So all, of the, all three of these feasts happen within the three or four days there. Now what's really remarkable is that the last year of Jesus' ministry, those all happened the same week where the Sabbath landed on Saturday. So the Sabbath was Saturday. The first fruits was Sunday. I got this right. First fruits was Sunday. Feast of the Unleavened Bread was that Friday. And the Passover was Thursday. Now, wait a minute. I thought Jesus was crucified on a Friday. He was he crucified on the, on the Passover. The Thursday of that week. Oh, now you're really shaking me up, Lee. First you tell me Christmas doesn't exist, and now... <laughs> okay. This is God's Word. A lot of study has gone into this. Not by me. I'm stealing stuff from other people here. All right? But understand, please do not get shipwrecked by things that seem new. Church tradition has Christ crucified on Friday. Church tradition has Christmas established December 25th, his birthday, if you will. If my memory serves correctly, the confrontation that Jesus had with the Pharisees was just about such things. He said, you are neglecting the truth of God's word in favor of your tradition. Okay? We want to focus on God's word. We don't want to focus on church tradition here. Now moving forward, we talk about the fe we can talk about the Feast of Weeks, which happens 50 days after the f uh, Feast of the Unleavened Bread. All right? In the particular case, we're going to see something really amazing in just a couple of moments. But after that, there's the Feast of Trumpets, and after that, the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of, the feast of Weeks is referred to as the Summer Feast, and the other three are referred to as the Fall Feasts. And they are coming up, in fact. Uh, Feast of Un... let's see... Feast of Trumpets, which is also called Rosh Hashanah. Um, that's going to be uh, on September 4th. It starts sunset September 4th and runs to the 6th. The Day of Atonement, which is also called Yom Kippur, that's going to be running from sunset on the 13th to sunset on the 14th. And then the Feast of, of Tabernacles is, is a little bit later on in the year. Now, in, in my, wife's, my wife's case and I, we have, we have somebody that's planning to do some work for us, and he called up in a little bit of a panic the other day. He's Jewish, and he's trying to schedule his work around the holidays that we're talking about here. Like I said, these, these are happening the September 4th, September 13th, these kinds of things. There are people to this day that still abide by those feasts, okay? There are Jews, believing Jews, that trust Christ for salvation, but they also still honor his word in the tradition. Important stuff. Now we've walked through, and I, and I can read the rest of this, but that would that would be kind of um, kind of tough because okay, Lee, this is kind of a history lesson. It's not all that exciting, and it's really great that you talk about this stuff. But you know, come on, let's get on with something. Okay. In the case of the spring and summer feasts, all four of those have been fulfilled in the New Testament. Now, I said that Christ was crucified on the Passover. Now, maybe some of us knew that already. But Passover definitely speaks to the specific you know, crucifixion of Christ. He was the Passover lamb. Remember what John the Baptist said about him? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what did they slaughter on the Passover? A lamb, spotless, without blemish. 
no sin in him, no, no discordant aspects to it. That was Jesus, crucified on the Passover. What happened right after the Passover? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember, they took his body down off the cross. They didn't break his legs, right? He, they were surprised that he died so quickly there. Remember, they jammed the spear into his side. What came out? Water. Blood and water, right? The reality of that is Jesus truly died from a broken heart. He didn't die because, because his hands and feet were pierced. He died because he bore the sin of the entire world in himself. That happened 2,000 years ago. I'm one of the older people in this room. I wasn't born back then. So even the stuff that I do to this day that's wrong, he chose to hang on that cross and pay for it. Paid for my sin. Paid for the sin that I caused my family to commit. <clears throat> Died of a broken heart. Crucified on the Passover. The next day, well, what happened after they took him down? Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus was also there. Took his body, wrapped him in spices, put him in the tomb of a wealthy man, rolled the stone over, right? On the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he was in that tomb. Unleavened bread. What's unleavened mean again? No yeast in Scripture. No sin. There's a passage in... Oh... I have the verse and I completely forgot it. There's a passage that says basically that, God, that Jesus' body would experience no corruption while he's in the tomb. So let me get this straight. He crucified on the Passover, fulfilling that. In the tomb, unsullied, fulfills that. What was the Feast of First Fruits again? That was the following Sunday. Sunday. What, happened? Why do, what do we celebrate at Easter? He rose again. He defeated hell and death. Death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? In the course of him standing before witnesses and declaring that I'm not in the grave, I have defeated hell and death, for all the world to see, he fulfilled that feast. And then something even more amazing happened after that. I mean, that was, well, nothing more amazing than that, but something else really cool happened after that. The next feast is the, the Feast of Weeks. There's another name for that. It's called Pentecost, which literally means 50 days. So 50 days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the Feast of Pentecost. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Acts chapter 2? 120 believers gathered together in an upper room. And what does it say happened there? Tongues of fire appeared over their heads. The Holy Spirit of God was poured out among, upon these believers in order that they might have the power to proclaim the truth of God's word to the entire world. Now, this is not when those believers got saved. you remember when the believers got saved? It was also in the upper room. Only this time, it was when Jesus breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. So these guys receive the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus dies. And then 50 days later, they have the anointing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit to do amazing and wondrous things. Remember, these are the guys that turn the world upside down. That's one of the quotes in Scripture about these guys. So that's the first four feasts that have been fulfilled in the New Testament. There's still three more feasts to go. They haven't been fulfilled yet. In the case of the fall feasts, Feast of Trumpets, 
This is going to be a Rosh Hashanah where we see Israel sign a seven-year peace agreement with the Antichrist. This one hasn't happened yet, but it will. And it's going to change the course of the entire nation, world, globe. Some of us are anxiously looking for that because there's nothing else that has to happen before that does. No other scripture needs to be fulfilled for, for, that, for that next thing to happen. And then what happens after that? The Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement is going to be the last day of this age. That will be after those seven years have elapsed and all hell breaks loose on this earth. And then after that, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is something else that we're looking forward to. And that's the great and glorious reign of Jesus Christ over all. Now I have to confess that before, before I did this study, I knew that Jesus was crucified on the Passover, but I didn't realize the timing of things at that point. I didn't realize how much of Scripture was fulfilled, how much of Old Testament Scripture was fulfilled in those three few days there. I'm a pretty well-educated man, but goodness gracious. Does God humble me in things like this? How somebody can walk through this life and not embrace Christ, I simply can no longer fathom. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Having said that, we're going to we're going to do communion here, and if you guys would begin getting ready for that, you can close your Bibles. This time is an appointed time. It's a sacred time. Every person in this room should be considering truly where they stand. If, if you're a believer, we're going to pass these elements out to you. In one hand, you're going to hold a cracker. It's matzah. It's unleavened. And that represents that pure body of Christ. On the other hand, you're going to hold a, a little cup of juice. And we recognized and acknowledged that that's just a representation of the blood that Christ shed on the cross on that Passover day all those years ago. As we consider those things and what he did for us, take the time. Think about, think about in your own life What's gone down? What has he rescued you from? What has he changed that you never could have changed on your own? What has he healed that the doctor said there's no way? What financial bind has he pulled you out of that the banker said, forget it? Now that's for the believers. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I have two things to say. Number one is, please, please reconsider. He only died for you. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if I was the only person on this planet, he still would have chosen to stay on that cross to pay for my sins so he could spend eternity with me. He did the same for you. If 
you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm going to say a prayer right now. You don't have to stand up. You don't even have to mouth the words. Just know them in your heart. Just follow me. Dear Lord, I stand before you and I ask you to forgive my sin. I invite you into my heart to be my Lord, to be my God, and to be my Savior. Again, forgive me of my sins, Lord. Wash me clean, for I've decided this day to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, if you didn't know Christ and prayed that prayer, then please feel free to partake from the elements that are being passed out. If you didn't know Christ and chose not to pray that prayer, please put the elements back. There's a little circle thing under the chair in front of you. Just put them back. Just stick the, stick the bread and the juice and stick it right there. And I say that because if you take these elements in an unworthy manner, you heap condemnation upon yourself. That's what scripture says. I don't want that to happen to you. Because I'd rather have you come back and then get saved next week or whenever it is so that then you can join the rest of us. All right? We so seldom fully realize how much he did for us. the bread represents his body unleavened unspotted by sin the only payment that God the Father accepts for our sin please take it represents the blood that he shed on that cross. Remember, he's God. He didn't have to stay on that cross. He could have come down from there, wiped out everybody that was gambling for his clothes, wiped out everybody that pounded a nail into his hands, wiped out everybody that spat on him as he was walking to his death. But he didn't do that. He chose to stay there. He chose to stay there to pay for my sins and your sins because he, because he wanted to spend eternity with us. He thinks enough of us to want to hang with us. This represents his blood shed on that cross. Please partake. <clears throat> Father, I pray that the, the hearts and minds that are present here this morning are right in tune with yours. We so appreciate what you did for us, Lord. Sometimes it takes a kind of harrowing experience to understand that. Sometimes it just takes time taken out of a service like this to once again reconcile who I was before Christ with who I am now. Father, I ask you to have your hand upon every family that's represented here today. Protect them, Lord. Provide for them. Heal their hurts. Minister them as only you can. Be Lord in their lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.